our time. Welcome to the third of six 2018 AVID events. I'm Jan Kaiser, a member of the Des Moines Public Library Foundation Board. Since 2001, there have been 134 AVID events attended by over 45,000 people just like you. AVID would not be possible without input from the Volunteer Selection Committee and the leadership of Sue Woody, the Community Engagement Librarian. Thanks to... <laughs> Thanks also to the outstanding staff at all six locations of the Des Moines Public Library for providing our community with free relevant and important resources that are transforming lives every day. The Des Moines Public Library Foundation and our great executive director, Dory Bryles, raised the funds for AVID, summer reading, and school readiness, programming for children, teens, and adults, new public access computers, and many other library needs bringing outstanding authors for AVID, offering programs, services, and the latest technology, and improving the library collections, all takes more money than our tax dollars can provide. Please help us continue to make a difference with your gift to the Library Foundation today. And there is a little donor envelope in your handout. We also tonight have a very exciting announcement to share. Nick Nolte, the author of Rebel, My Life Outside the Lines, and a three-time Academy Award nominee, will be featured this year at the Iowa Author Awards Dinner. The date and location will be determined in the next two weeks, so watch for more details. And if you would like to receive an invitation, please note that on the blue evaluation form, and please remember to write legibly. <laughs> so here's a few details. Please make sure they're numbered. One, please make sure your cell phones are on silent mode. Two, after the presentation, please complete the blue evaluation form. form and turn it in at the information table for a drawing for a, an AVID journal. Then also, number three, purchase a book and have your book autographed by Amor Tolls. Beaverdale Books will donate 10% of book sales to the foundation. Thank you, Beaverdale Books. Another big thank you to the volunteers and the sponsors who make AVID possible. Here's the list. Nationwide Foundation, Bravo Greater Des Moines, Humanities Iowa, a state-based affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Principal Financial Group, Brad and Kelly Edmister, Douglas and Deborah West, Cultivating Compassion, the Dr. Richard Deming Foundation, O'Brien Fitzpatrick Foundation, Karen Schaff and Steve Jane, Dr. Catherine and Andrew Hauser, Pam Bass Bookie and Harry Bookie, Jan Kaiser, Don Taylor, Judy Blank, Martin and Shelley Brody, Dr. R Linda Railsback, Barbara and John Yankee, Al Leiserwitz Memorial, and our media sponsor, the Des Moines Register. Also, I want to remind you that you can find podcasts of interviews with the AVID authors and a wealth of information about the authors and their books on the AVID website at dmpl.org AVID. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator, Suku Radia. Suku is one of Des Moines' most prominent business leaders. He recently retired as Bankers Trust CEO 
after a decade at the helm. And before that, he served as CFO at Meredith and as a managing partner for KPMG in Des Moines. Suku emigrated from Uganda in 1971 to attend Iowa State University, go Cyclones, and the business record named Suku the most influential business leader in Greater Des Moines multiple times. Please join me in welcoming Suku Radia. Thank you for that very warm introduction, Jan. It was a work of fiction. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. You're in for a real treat this evening. Amor Coles is our guest this evening, as you heard. He published his first old novel in his mid-40s, and it found instant success. That book, Rules of Civility, came when Mr. Coles was in the midst of a 20-year career as an investment banker in a boutique firm. The novel followed the lives of three people in New York City in the late 1930s, and it was a New York Times bestseller and was named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the best books of 2011. You recall the country was still in the depth of the Great Recession at the time that this book was published. Now, I know a number of investment bankers, and I have no doubt that they were very envious of our guest this evening, because he didn't have to rely on the world of mergers and acquisitions to enjoy success. There wasn't much in the M&A world at that time. Writing wasn't a new passion for him, however. After graduating from Yale, he received his master's degree in English from Stanford. His thesis, a short story cycle called The Temptations of the Pleasure was actually published in 1989 by the Paris Review number 112, which was the winter 1989 edition of it. He continued writing in his spare time at the investment firm. His career allowed him to continue refining his art without the pressure and urgency of being an investment banker. And his next novel, a gentleman in Moscow found even more success. Mr. Tolls was inspired by his time as an investment banker. During one visit to Geneva, he was at a luxury hotel he had visited in the past. And as he looked around, he noticed some familiar faces in the lobby and he realized that some people actually lived in that hotel. Combining that with his passion for Russian history, he created a story about a Russian aristocrat set during the Russian Revolution. After the Bolsheviks take control, Count Rostov is sentenced to house arrest in Moscow's Hotel Metropole. As the intra-war year wars pass, Rostov watches the world pass by living in luxury. Our guest this evening lives in Manhattan with his wife and his two children. He now writes full time and we're very excited to have him here in Des Moines this evening. So please give him a warm Iowa welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, I, I want to thank the library, the foundation, uh, for inviting me here to be a part of the AVID series. And I want to thank all of you for coming out uh, this afternoon to hear me speak. Um, as many of you know, my relatively newish novel, A Gentleman in Moscow, has a rather unusual premise in that it opens at a Bolshevik tribunal in the Kremlin in 1922 where a 30-year-old aristocrat is being interviewed. And in the course of this brief interview, it becomes clear that the Count wrote a poem as a young man that was very popular with the revolutionary generation. So he has some friends in the upper ranks of the party, as it were, 
But on the other hand, it also becomes clear that he's an unrepentant aristocrat. So as something of a compromise, the tribunalist decides that the count can go back to the hotel where he's been staying, and if he ever comes out of the hotel again, he will be shot. And with the snap of the gavel, he's marched out of the Kremlin, across Red Square, and through the doors of the historic Metropole Hotel, and that's where he spends the next 32 years. And that's where I ask you to spend 32 years with him. Um, now, where did this odd premise come from? Um, I began writing fiction as a kid. I wrote it in high school, I wrote it in college, I wrote it in graduate school. But when I moved to New York at the age of 25, I joined a friend of mine who had started an investment firm, and 20 years later, we were still working side by side. Now ultimately, in my capacity as a spokesperson for the firm, I would spend a week in any given year in a hotel in Chicago, a week in a hotel in London, a week in a hotel in Los Angeles, and one year, as was mentioned a moment ago, when I was arriving at my hotel in Geneva for the eighth year in a row, as I came into the hotel, I recognized some of the people lingering in the lobby um, from the year before. It was as if they had never left. And I thought to myself, you know, this is a nice hotel, but can you imagine if you actually had to live in it? Now, in the elevator on the way upstairs, I thought, that's actually kind of an interesting idea for a book. A guy gets trapped in a hotel for a long period of time. So in my hotel room, I took out the hotel stationery and I began sketching the outline for this tale. Now, right off the bat, I knew that if I was going to take my protagonist and trap him in a hotel for 30 years, he shouldn't be there by preference. He should be there by force. And that made me think of Russia for some reason. <laughs> this little intellectual imaginative leap there but as soon as I thought of Russia, I knew that I wanted to set my story in the Metropole Hotel. Now, I had never spent the night in the Metropole, but I had visited it when I went to Moscow for the first time in 1998. The hotel is quite famous architecturally. Uh, for instance, uh, in the ground floor dining room, there's a giant hand-painted glass ceiling. So I had gone to have a drink at the hotel with a friend, and we had marveled at this famous glass ceiling. So I knew something of the hotel. Now, but ultimately, my decision to set my story in that hotel comes down to two factors. And the first factor, quite naturally enough, is location. Well, let's see if this works. Oh, there it is. Awesome. So, this is a map of central Moscow. Um, now, right in the center of this map, right there, is a little green triangle. And that green triangle is the Kremlin, the thousand-year-old stone-walled fortress uh, in which the czars lived, and from which they ruled over Russia until Peter the Great moved the capital of Russia from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Now, just to the right of that green triangle, you can see sort of a narrow white space. That's Red Square, which is just a great tiled square with an ancient cathedral on either end. Now, if you went out the top of Red Square and took a right, in about a half a block, you'd end up in a grand 19th century plaza that is known as Theater Square, and that's shown in the inset map in the lower right-hand corner here. Now, Theater Square uh, has uh, plantings, plantings and fountains in the middle, and it is surrounded by five majestic 19th century buildings, each of which has been very important in the life and history of Moscow. In the lower left-hand corner, you have a building that before the revolution was known as the Palace of the Nobles. It was basically the private club of the nobility. It's where they would gather to celebrate national holidays, weddings, and that sort of thing. After the revolution, it became known as the Palace of the Unions, and it's where Lenin's body was first held in state so the citizens of Moscow could come pay their respects uh, before his body was embalmed and moved to Red Square. It's also the building where the famous show trials were held in uh, the late 1930s. At the top of the square, you have the Bolshoi, which is where the ballet performed then, it's where the ballet still performs today. In the upper right-hand corner, you have what was the most expensive department store in Moscow before the revolution and after the revolution too. Next, you have the Mali Theater, which is one of the two most important dramatic theaters in Russia. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, you have the Metropole itself. So as I said, for my brief visit to the hotel, I knew that it was very central in the geography of Moscow, 
as well as in terms of the history of the city. But of course, my primary interest in setting the story at the Metropole was the hotel itself. Here it is. Uh, this picture dates from not long after the hotel opened, so this is probably around 1910. Um, everything you see in this picture is the Metropole Hotel. So it's about the size of a city block with hundreds of rooms. Now when it opened in 1905, it was the best hotel in Moscow. It was the best hotel in Russia. Uh, made with the finest materials. It had uh, Italian marble imported uh, in the lobby. Uh, it had imported Venetian crystal in the chandeliers that were throughout the building. Um, and it had uh, French furniture in the bedrooms. So in addition, it was the first hotel in Russia to have uh, telephones in the bedrooms. It was the first hotel in Russia to have hot water in the bedrooms. So from its opening, it was the height of elegance in Russia as a hotel. But having said that the Metropole was relatively unique in Russia, it was far from unique in the West. Because the period between 1890 and 1910, this is the golden age of the Grand Hotel. Uh, in that period, uh, large-scale, luxurious hotels were being opened in every major city of Europe, every major city of the United States, as well as along the Mediterranean coast and the Florida coast. Um, this is when the Waldorf Astoria gets going in New York City, when the Palace opens in San Francisco, when the Breakers opens in Palm Beach. And what the grand hotels tended to have in common is that they were all the size of a city block. They were all made with the finest materials. But in addition, they would have had uh, a card room, a billiard room, a library. They would have had a great palm court in which tea was served in the afternoon. They had multiple restaurants. And on the ground floor, on the circumference of the building, they had shops that you could enter from the lobby or from the street outside. Now, of course, the grand hotels had been designed uh, to meet the expectations of the great new wealth that grew out of the 19th century for the Vanderbilts and their ilk, who were on their grand European tours and who had very high expectations of the kind of place they would stay as they went from city to city to city. But to some degree, the grand hotels were being designed to do something that hotels had not really been designed to do before, and that was to become an extension of their city. And what I mean by that, the best way I can put this for you, is to say that if you had gone to the Metropole in the decade after it opened, on a Saturday night, more than half the people that you saw passing through the lobby would have been Muscovites, not foreigners. It would have been the local Russians on their way to the coffee house to meet friends, or to dine in the fine restaurant, which was the best in the city, or to dance to one of the various orchestras that was playing in the building. So from its opening, the Metropole was very much at the center of the social fabric of the city of Moscow, visited on a weekly basis by the intelligentsia, uh, by the nobility, and uh, by the haute bourgeoisie. Now, having said that the Metropole shared many of these attributes with the grand hotels of Europe, a distinguishing characteristic of the Metropole as a grand hotel is that 12 years after it opened, it found itself in the middle of a proletarian revolution. And it was very much in the middle of things. Um, in 1917, as revolutionary activity is heating up, a great deal of it is centered in St. Petersburg. Because that's where the Tsar was, holed up in the Winter Palace, the Hermitage. But there's a lot of revolutionary activity in, in Moscow as well. And so eventually, uh, the soldiers who are on permanent station in the Kremlin end up taking over part of the Metropole Hotel I'm having determined that given its scale and its location, it was the perfect bastion from which to defend the weakest flank of the Kremlin. So snipers were put in these rooms, some of the corner uh, rooms here, overlooking Theater Square, just in case anything untoward should happen. Now, quite naturally, in response to this, the Bolsheviks ended up building a barricade across the middle of Theater Square, and they stood behind the barricades with their weapons in their hands and their backs to the Bolshoi and you end up in sort of a Mexican standoff. Now, in October 1917, 
revolutionary activity finally boils over in St. Petersburg, and the revolutionaries storm the Winter Palace and seize the Tsar and his family, and suddenly the revolutionaries are in control of the capital. News of this reaches Moscow 24 hours later, and the Bolsheviks who are in Theater Square decide enough is enough, and they bombard the Metropole Hotel with everything they've got, breaking every single window in the hotel. Um, but they successfully drive the snipers out of the hotel, and they drive the soldiers out of the Kremlin, seize the Kremlin, and now the revolutionaries are in control of the city of Moscow as well. Uh, we actually have a very interesting first-hand account of these events from an American. John Reed, the great American journalist whom Warren Beatty immortalized in the movie Reds, was a classic Greenwich Village lefty. He loved revolutionary activity, uh, wherever it was. And when he sensed that there might be a revolution in Russia, he left New York, he sailed across the Atlantic, traveled to St. Petersburg, and he arrived just in time to follow the soldiers into the Winter Palace. Now, when he came back out, he decided, I gotta go to Moscow and see what's happening. So he boards an overnight train filled with soldiers. And he arrives in Moscow shortly after the battle for Theater Square. And the first thing he does is he goes to the Metropole Hotel, um, because it's the only hotel that he knows by reputation. Now, when he arrives, he goes to the desk and he asks if they have a room for him for the night. And in this great 19th century grand hotel, unflappable fashion, the desk captain replies, we do have a room provided that the gentleman doesn't mind a little fresh air. <laughs> now, at this point, the revolutionaries are in control of Moscow and St. Petersburg, but this does not represent the end of hostilities in Russia. This represents the beginning of a five-year civil war. Eight foreign countries send troops into Russia with their own agendas. The whites, the soldiers who are loyal to the Tsar are continuing to roam the countryside in small battalions, looking to pick fights with the Red Army wherever they can strategically, in the hopes of turning back the tide of history. The revolutionaries are not a single force. They are multiple factions who have been kind of working together, but are also elbowing each other for control of the situation. Now, pretty early on, uh, it's the, the faction that is in control of Moscow and St. Petersburg is the Bolshevik faction. And they, of course, are led by the father of the revolution, of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Here he is in this uh, very famous iconic photograph. I like to think of this as Lenin's Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic pose, <laughs> sort of leaning there out over the podium, as it, as it were. Now, uh, this, this photograph is taken in 1920. So this is right in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, it's in Theater Square. Uh, behind Lenin is the Mali Theater that I pointed out on the map a minute ago. And if you look at the right side of this pho uh, photograph, the thin sliver of a building that you see, that's the edge of the Metropole Hotel. Because Theater Square is exactly where you would go if you had an important speech and you wanted to gather a large audience. Um, now what Lenin is doing here is he is speaking to the factory workers of Moscow. And he's trying to convince them to leave their jobs and to go join the Red Army and head out to the Polish frontier. Uh, at this point, uh, in the middle of the Civil War, the great fear that the Bolsheviks had was that a Western power would take advantage of the chaos of the Civil War to launch a full-scale invasion. So they were constantly recruiting new soldiers for the Red Army uh, to go out and protect the Western Front. Now, this photograph is actually very famous for another reason. And that is that while Lenin was the father of the revolution and the first head of the new Russian government, his number two during the revolution and in the new government was, of course, his old friend and comrade, Leon Trotsky. And as usual, Trotsky is standing right here beside Lenin as he gives this speech. Now, you, you needn't bother looking for him. Uh, now, here he is. There you see him right here in the captain's hat with the mustache leaning sort of against the podium as Lenin speaks. Now, if you look at these two pictures, you can see that they're taken sort of seconds apart. 
and that Trotsky is not in the first photograph I showed you. Now that's not because Trotsky has excused himself to go to the washroom or what have you. But what's happened here is that while Trotsky was one of the first leaders of the new Russian government, he was also the first communist to fall out of favor. He was pretty quickly uh, pushed out of the Politburo. Then he was kicked out of the Communist Party. Then he was sent into exile. And eventually, he was assassinated in Mexico City by Russian agents. And when that happened, the Bolsheviks went back and they airbrushed him out of all the photographs because <laughs> they didn't want Lenin to have to share his great moments of history with his old friend and comrade who had fallen from grace. Now, by 1922, the Bolsheviks are in control of the whole show. They have successfully sealed the border, they have destroyed the White Army, and they've consolidated control of the revolutionary factions, either through coercion or force. But they are in control of the whole show. And the first thing they do when they're in charge is they move the capital of Russia from St. Petersburg back to Moscow. Now this poses a significant problem for the Bolsheviks because Moscow did not have the infrastructure to support a modern government. You could not use the Kremlin for that purpose. It was just an old stone building. It hadn't been used as a seat of government in hundreds of years. So what the Bolsheviks did is they seized the three best hotels in the city. The National, the Savoy, and the Metropole. The Metropole is renamed the second house of the Soviets. They kick out all the guests, and they sweep aside the luxuries. And the first thing they do is they put many of the leaders of the new government in the suites on the second floor. Because you want to keep in mind that the leaders of the Russian Revolution, for the most part, were not Muscovites, and many of them weren't even Russian. So they literally needed places to stay. So they're given the fancy suites. Um, but the other bedrooms are empty, and they're being used for all manner of governmental agencies and offices. The ballroom is empty and is used for votes and speeches. The fine dining room is emptied and filled with cots so they can keep a standing battalion in the building at all times, just in case. The first constitution of the new Russia was written in suite 217 of the Metropole Hotel under lock and key. So basically, at this point, the Metropole is the single largest uh, bureaucratic building in the new Russia, and that should have represented the end of its life as a grand hotel. But an interesting thing happens over the course of 1922, and that is that the major Western European powers start to recognize the Bolsheviks as the legitimate government in Russia. Now, it takes the United States more than a decade to come around to that point of view, but the European nations do it very quickly. And you want to keep in mind that at that point, the European nations had just spent 100 years getting rid of kings and emperors and replacing them with some form of quasi-democratic government. So from their standpoint, it was long overdue to get rid of the czar, good riddance, and they felt that the Bolsheviks represented the will of the people. So they recognized the Bolsheviks as the legitimate government. And what that means is that by the end of 1922, ambassadors start showing up in the city of Moscow. Trade representatives from the major Western European powers come to Moscow. Corporate executives from the biggest corporations in Europe and the United States come to Moscow eager to establish ties with the new regime so they can do business. Now, pretty quickly, the Bolsheviks realize that if they let these sophisticated visitors from the West come to Moscow and they put them up in crummy proletarian hotels, they run the risk that the visitors will go back to New York and Paris and London with the news that the revolution is failing. So, the Bolsheviks kicked all the party guys out of the Metropole Hotel, and they began restoring it to its pre-war glamour. Suddenly, there's a uniformed doorman back out in front. There are bellhops in the lobby. There is champagne and caviar in the dining room. And they reassemble the old orchestra which starts playing American jazz on a nightly basis. Now, initially, the restored glamour and liberty with inside the walls of the Metropole is reserved for foreigners. An ordinance is passed in the city of Moscow 
which forbids any Russian citizen from going into a foreign designated restaurant or hotel, of which the Metropole is basically example number one. So initially, the glamour and liberty in the Metropole is just for the foreigners. But the citizens of Moscow, over time, reclaim the Metropole. And this happens in two waves. The first wave is that many of the leaders of the Communist Party start hanging out at the Metropole. They decide, you know what? The food's pretty good, the liquor's good, the music's nice. So they are dining there with their comrades, their protégés, their mistresses. Now, I think if you asked most Americans, what percentage of the Russian population was communist in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and into the Cold War, most Americans would say 90%, 75%, certainly more than half, when in reality, only 10% of the Russian population were members of the Communist Party throughout this period. Now, this is not because the other 90% didn't want to be members of the Communist Party. This is because the other 90% were not allowed to be members of the Communist Party. Um, at the time of the First World War, membership in the Communist Party was basically a badge of ideological honor. If you were a member of the party, it's because you could quote your Marx and Engels. You had printed pamphlets in basements. You had tried to organize trade unions. And you'd probably done some time. And that's what's earned you your place in the Communist Party. But after the revolution, pretty quickly, membership in the Communist Party became a gateway to privilege. If you were a member of the Communist Party, uh, you had access to special apartment buildings with larger apartments that you would not have to share with other families. If you were a member of the party, you had ac access to special grocery stores where not only was there bread and milk on a daily basis, there were delicacies. If you were a member of the party, your children were given better opportunities. And you tended to be treated better by the judicial system. So for most of the Soviet era, uh, being a member of the Communist Party was a huge advantage to you and your family. And membership was doled out very selectively to those individuals who had paid their dues to the party and proven their loyalty to the powers that be. So basically, this group is hanging out at the Metropole Hotel despite the prohibition because they can do whatever they want. But the second wave is a bigger wave. And what brings this about is a financial crisis. So what I want you to remember is that at the time of the First World War, Russia was the most backward of all the great Western nations. Uh, at the time of the First World War, 95% of the Russian population was illiterate. Uh, at the time, 85% of the population were peasants who were still uh, plowing with wooden plows and oxen on somebody else's land, much as their great-great-grandparents had done under serfdom, the Russian form of indentured slavery. There was very little industry in Russia. So Russia was way behind uh, America, England, Austria, Italy. And after the revolution, the Bolsheviks wanted to vault over 50 years, half a century of failed investment in order to bring Russia quickly into parity with the other Western nations from an industrial standpoint. And this is what the famous five-year plans were all about, the rapid industrialization of Russia. Now, the problem the Bolsheviks had was that Russia did not have the equipment or the expertise to modernize. The good news for the Bolsheviks was that the Western nations, including the United States, were perfectly happy to sell their equipment and expertise to the communists, but they didn't want to get the new Russian currency for those goods. They didn't want to get an IOU. What they wanted was hard currency, and that meant the British pound, uh, the Swiss uh, franc, the US dollar, or gold. Now initially, the Bolsheviks had a significant stockpile of hard currency that they had seized from the nobility. And they were using this to fund the five-year plans, but then they began to run out, threatening the modernization of Russia. Now, at this point, the good news is that there was still a lot of hard currency in Russia. It's just that it was under the mattresses 
of the citizens. Pretty early on, the Russian citizens had learned to distrust the new Russian currency, which was experiencing incredible inflation, and they had figured out that they could use foreign currency very effectively in the black market to buy goods for their family. So they were hoarding their foreign currency. So the Bolsheviks came up with this ingenious compromise. They said, okay, we're gonna reopen the foreign designated hotels and restaurants to the public, provided that when you dine at the Metropole, you pay your bill in foreign currency. And through this compromise, the Bolsheviks rake in the hard currency they need to complete the industrialization of Russia, and the citizens of Moscow once again reclaim access to the liberty and luxury inside the hotel. Now, just in case you think I'm making this up, <laughs> and I'm not above that, by the way, <laughs> what I'd like to do is to read for you a brief passage from the memoirs of Eugene Lyons. Now, Eugene Lyons was the United Press International Moscow correspondent in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, and he wrote a, a lot about the Metropole. And the reason he wrote about the Metropole is because uh, from the time of the revolution, right through the Cold War, the bar at the Metropole Hotel was the watering hole for all of the British and American journalists. So they all talk about it at some length in their, in their memoirs. Now what Lyons is gonna describe here is sort of a glimpse of what's going on inside the hotel in the early 1930s. I kinda want you to keep in the back of your mind. What that means is that this is just a few years after the great Ukrainian famine when millions died, um, a time of great shortages in Russia, and it's just a few years before the great purge starts to ramp up. So basically, in the middle of what is a very challenging decade for the Russian citizenry, this is what's going on inside the walls of the hotel, as witnessed by Lyons. The Metropole was the new social center for the bourgeois colony. Its main restaurant was a Russian peasant's dream of capitalist splendors. Immense candelabra, oversized lights, heavy furniture, a jazz band of symphony orchestra proportions, the chief pride of the restaurant was a great circular pool where lights and rather proletarian-looking fishes played. On grand occasions, the chef, in cap and apron, emerged from his sanctum with a net over his shoulder and captured a fish to cook for special customers bearing foreign currency. The dancing couples rotated around the pool, and sometimes an unsteady customer joined the fishes to the great delight of the assembled crowd. Now, here we are. Oh, this is the dining room. So, you know, from this picture, you're looking at about 60% of the room, let's say. Uh, there you can see the, the giant hand-painted glass ceiling. I know it's a little bright, but there you can see the hand-painted glass ceiling that I mentioned earlier in my remarks. Um, you know, you have the giant lights that uh, Lyons is describing. There's the pool uh, right here that the, the fish were caught in by the chef, the bandstand in the back. Now, the only thing different of a period photograph is that there would have been about three or four times as many tables with everybody crowded in there, elbow to elbow, having a gay old time. Now, what I love about the Lion's Passage is that it, it could easily have come from the memoirs of someone in F. Scott Fitzgerald's circle uh, describing what was going on at the Plaza Hotel in New York in the 1920s. It is crazy that this is what was going on inside the Metropole Hotel across the street from the Kremlin, and around the corner from the headquarters of the secret police at the height of the Stalinist era. And this is really the paradox that I was interested in, why I wanted to set my story at the Metropole. Now, for those of you who have not read the book, I should point out that most of what I've just said isn't in the book, is not in the book. You know, the book, the book is, is not a work of history, it's not a Wikipedia entry, it's a novel, and so very much uh, at the center of it, appropriately, are individuals. And most importantly is the figure of the Count, who at the age of 30 has just lost his family, his possessions, his social standing, and in a way more profoundly, he's watching as everything that he cares about in Russian life is being systematically uprooted by the powers that be. This is the way he begins his life in the Metropole. 
Now and then, over the course of his 30 years there, he is going to need to establish new relationships. He's going to need to find new causes for happiness, however small. And ultimately, he's going to need to find a new sense of purpose. And this is really what the book is all about. Having said all that, uh, I'm going to join my moderator and we'll open the floor to questions. Thank you. Both of the books are available for sale this evening by Beaverdale Book. That's, <laughs> That's not a question. <laughs> and he would be happy to autograph them before, <laughs> right after we're through with the Q&A. And as you're writing your questions down, thank you again for supporting the Des Moines Public Library's Everett series. There are three more amazing authors coming this spring, and as you heard, the next event is on May 3rd at DMU with Stephanie Powell Watts. Uh, DMU is a 3200 Grand Avenue, and there's plenty of parking available. Um, <laughs> I thought I should throw that in. Um, but, but thank you. That was very good. And while you're writing your questions down, uh, let me go ahead and begin. <laughs> the, you know, the protagonist is an Epicurean, an Enophile. So tell us about your level of sophistication as a wine connoisseur. <laughs> Uh, my, my sophistication, I, I don't know as much about wine as I pretended to in the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> so, what I want. But I do know a lot about food, I guess. I'm, 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 I know more about the food side than the wine side. I the thing, the, the, thing I, the, the most I know about wine is, is that I love to drink it, so that, that counts. But, um, but yes, I, I do a lot of cooking, and a lot of the dishes in the book are uh, foods that I have cooked over the course of my life. Um, you know, if, if, for those who don't know that, don't know this, uh, the Latvian stew, which kind of plays this important role at uh, sort of a Christmas Eve dinner in the grand dining room as the Count is sort of spying on a young couple who's kind of uh, on a date, and he watches the boy, you know, order this stew, and he orders it for himself. I cook that, and that, if you Google Amor Toll's Latvian stew, I've, there's a, I've written an essay, and the recipe is available. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, it's, it's delicious. I would highly recommend it. But yeah, so I, I, I do uh, uh, like food, but, but you know, it's interesting. I, I get asked about uh, the food in the book a lot, and I, in a way, it kind of it surprises me um, how I guess it, food is not written about as, as much as you think in novels. I mean, because the reason I say that's surprising to me is is it's such an important part of all of our lives. You know, it's how we gather for feasts and how the family gathers, and you know, we, we're, we're we're constantly eating. So uh, you know, it's funny to me that 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 it doesn't play as as much of a role in in a lot of fiction. Uh, particularly because it's a great way, I think, to bring the reader into a moment in time, is through the sensation of food. Um, you know, the Count is under house arrest, and did the constraints of being under house arrest, how did that impact your writing? Well, how did it impact my writing? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know. Yeah, uh, so the, the um, I, would, I would say that, that um, I, it wasn't. It, it was. It did not pose a dramatic challenge. I think there was a moment where I was like, you know, setting a 400-plus page book inside one building. Building, you know, uh, I'm taking a little bit of a risk there for myself, for my reader. But, but it, in, in retrospect, um, you know, it, it, it's a device that can be very productive uh, for an author. Um, there's a lot of narrative that is structured in that way, in, in ways that you don't necessarily think of it in that way. For instance, to me, a, you know, a great example is Moby Dick. Um, you know, I'm not trying to compare myself to Herman Melville, who's a great hero of mine, but if you think about Moby Dick, um, in the very early pages, Ishmael boards uh, the vessel, Ahab's ship, and he never gets off again until the very last page. And, and you know, we spend the entire novel within the bounds of the ship, and, and by adopting that constraint, uh, what Melville has to do uh, to hold our interest and to allow the book to mean as much as it can, he brings the world into the ship, you know, through stories, through allusions, through the memories of the various uh, 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 players, through 
uh, a description of the commerce of whaling. And through all these various things, we, we, kind of, we, we can kind of, through this life on the ship, we can get a glimpse of the entire planet in a way, and all kinds of aspects of life. And, and so th that's kind of a fun part of the challenge, ultimately, is to take the hotel and try to bring that experience of life through the doors uh, so that the book feels bigger and broader than the spatial confines. As, as you went through more than one rendition of the book in terms of a draft, were there any surprises as you got deeper into the research? Um, well, I, I don't, it's, it's not really a research-driven process for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, uh, so, so, but you know, if I understand the spirit of your question, um, and I guess I should back up and say this, because you've obviously done your, res you've done your research on me. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so I, will, I, will, I will share, I will share with the audience, uh, you know, a glimpse of my process, which is that um, I am, I am very much an outliner. So uh, when before I start chapter one in a book, I have been outlining a book for certainly more than a year, um, and have been thinking about it for years. Uh, and when the outline is finished, it it describes what happens in every chapter, every event. Uh, all the characters and their backgrounds, the settings, uh, some of the thema themes that are playing out, uh, some of the philosophical conversations, some of the poetic passages. So the outline is quite comprehensive. Now, having said that, yes, the process of writing the first draft, which I will generally I will try to take, write the first draft in a year to a year and a half, um, there will be surprises in the course of writing that, as as. Um, I'm like, oh yeah, no, this isn't what happens, that's what happens, or this character's gonna do this, not that, and, and that's a lot of fun, uh, kind of discovering how the story is gonna veer from the outline. But then I will revise my work, the book from beginning to end three times over the course of, say, two years. And that will be, continue to be a part of, uh, of a process of discovery um, where new things will present themselves. And I think like, and a good example in, uh, in A Gentleman in Moscow, for instance, um, for those who've read it, is uh, Casablanca plays a very important role in uh, the sort of the, the final quarter of the novel, uh, the, American, the great American movie, um, and it was not in the first draft, anywhere near to that degree. Uh, Humphrey Bogart was. Uh, there is, uh, you know, again, for those of you who've read it, I, who have not read it, I'll sort of give you a flavor for this. I knew early on that I wanted the characters, uh, the, the Count is, is befriended by a, a party captain, as it were, who wants to learn about the West, and I knew they were gonna you know, eat dinner and talk about the West and read books together and eventually see movies together. Now, many Americans may find this surprising, but American cinema was very popular during the early stages of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, the Marx Brothers were great heroes uh, in Russia at that time. Um, and, and in fact, so much so that uh, in the 1950s, I think it was, uh, Harpo Marx was sent to Russia as an American cultural ambassador. And, and it turned out this was funded by the CIA. And, and what, what they thought Harpo Marx was gonna do for them, who knows? But, but, but so the Ameri American film was very popular uh, Stalin loved American Westerns. That was his favorite form of cinema, cinema the American Western. So I knew they were gonna watch movies and, and I had it in my mind that Bogart was gonna be the, the, the figure and, uh, and I wrote in the first draft a, a section really, it was really about the Maltese Falcon. And um, only when I was revising the first draft, I just it didn't like it, it wasn't working. And I kept trying to rewrite those sections and it still wasn't working. And then I was like, you know, maybe, maybe it's not the Maltese Falcon. And, and, and then, the minute, then as soon as I thought that, I was like, oh my God, of course, it's Casablanca. What am I thinking? And, and you know, you have this moment where you can kind of see the whole thing, and, and not, not, not only the relevance of the movie in the case of the book, but how it's going to play its role in various parts of the book. You know, I can instantly see how it's going to fit in, like a, a piece of a puzzle or the, you know, the tumblers of a, of a, of a vault. Um, you know, and most importantly, because as you know, you've all seen the movie, you think of Casablanca, it, it is a city you know, in a time of war, in the middle of the Second War, where uh, the Germans weren't totally in charge, the Americans weren't in charge, and so, you know, all kinds of Europeans were ending up there in the hopes of getting out of Europe. And so, Casablanca is kind of an oasis, and within the oasis is Rick's Cafe, which is even, a, you know, a smaller oasis, where everybody is gathering, eating, and drinking, and gambling, and with their hopes and their fears, kind of on a nightly basis. And, you know, kind of, it's sort of like, that's like what the hotel is 
in many ways. And um, so, so, you know, that's fun. But, but, you know, the biggest and most pleasurable surprise for me uh, is that uh, inevitably as I'm in working in the final quarter of the book, even in the revising of the final quarter, you're kind of trying to find some moments, some scenes, some passages, a sentence, a comment that brings a central theme of the book to the surface. You know, in a, in a, you know, you have to kind of lay it all out, but suddenly there's a moment where you're like, yes, this is one of the things that this book is about in a serious way. And, and there, there was, I was struggling, I knew that I wanted this idea that was kind of, I couldn't quite articulate it, I knew it was important, I didn't have the right way for it to be expressed, and in the process of doing the, the revision, I went and having decided Casablanca is gonna be this movie that they talk about, um, and it's gonna play this kind of role, I went back and watched the first 15 minutes five times, you know, and I'd seen it a million times, but, and in the course of re-watching the scene where Peter Lorre Ugarte is arrested at Rick's cafe. There's gunfire, he sees, he's dragged out, you know, uh, the letters of transit are in question. After the commotion, Rick, you know, very suavely sort of says to everybody, okay, you know, everything, every, everybody's in shock, you know, everybody's upset. He says, it's every, you know, it's all over, folks. Everything's fine. You know, let's we can go back and having a nice time. He signals Sam to start playing. And as he's walking back towards his office, he literally, it's like this, he walks by and there's a martini glass, in essence, on its side that was knocked over in the commotion. And without even stopping, he just kind of goes like that and keeps moving. And I was like, oh, and I'd never noticed it before. And I was like, that's it. That's, that's the whole, that's in a way, that's a big, that's a big theme in this book, is this, this notion that that's what the Count is doing you know, under duress, in a time where everything is out of his control, where the world is changing in ways that, that uh, are contrary to his nature. You, know, you have to ask yourself, do I quit? You know, do I throw myself off the roof of the building? Do I go along for the ride? You know, do I change my, view, my values in, in accordance with this other thing? Or do I try to rebel in some way? You know, I, I can't turn the tie back of history but ultimately, I think what the Count has is this faith that through very small actions that, that he can influence the course of history, much in the way that, that Rick, you know, just uprighting the glass, you're gonna have the faith that somehow that's gonna make the evening kind of run a little bit more smoothly, and that that became a big theme. So yes, like that was a, one of these pleasant surprises in the final pages of drafting where I'm like, yeah, that really works for me. This one I'm gonna have to read verbatim from the audience. Did your background as an investment banker and presumably as a serious capitalist make it easier to write on the opposite side of communism? <laughs> uh, not, not really. I mean, not really. I will, you know, and I, I was in the investment management business, and, and what I would say about the investment management, my, I loved my career, I loved my colleagues and my clients and, uh, and, our, and, our, and our craft. Um, it, has, it has very, has had very little influence on the, my, my writing in any way, except for this. This is the biggest influence. And, and it was that um, because I had a career, uh, and I, you know, I kind of went back to, to writing while I was in the midst of this career. Uh, I, I, I had been writing since I was a kid. When I was 25, I stopped writing for a while uh, as we were kind of building the firm. I didn't write for a decade. And, uh, and I kind of knew when I actually, but when I was in that period of not writing, I knew that if I didn't write a work of fiction that I was proud of, by the time I was, say, 50, that I would probably end up bitter and a drinker, you know? And, um, and, and now I'm just a drinker, but, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> the bitter part I pushed aside. But, but, so, but so at the age of 35, I was like, okay, I gotta start writing fiction again. So even though I was on the job, I began writing. I spent seven years writing a novel I didn't like. I learned a lot from that experience. And then I wrote Rules of Civility. Um, and and so, so where I'm going with this is that uh, the best thing my firm did for me as an artist, without question, is that by the time I was uh, you know, 42 and writing Rules of Civility, um, I didn't have to do it for anybody. You know, it, it wasn't my income. You know, I had a job, so I, had a, you know, I, could, I could send my kids to school. There was a, you know, a roof over our heads. Uh, none of my friends even thought of me as a writer. Uh, nobody in my family was waiting for me to come out with a book. Nobody was asking me, how's that book coming? 
You know, it was, and you know, I wasn't really, I wasn't competing with my peers. You know, they didn't know I was writing. So, so it was this kind of, it was this wonderful thing, which was, I'm just doing it for myself. And I think that, that Rules of Civility was a, was a much better book at the age of 43 than I would have written at the age of 25 if I had all of those various anxieties kind of drifting over uh, the endeavor, the, the creative endeavor. But so yeah, that was the best part of it. Very good. Um, this question came up three times. What is the significance of the chapter heading with, or beginning with A? <laughs> yeah, all of the chapters, uh, the words in all of the chapters are all A words. So even in chapters with three words, they're all A words. And I don't, I don't really have a good answer for this one. I don't, I don't, so, you know, I, I kind of had an instinct early on that I'm going to use A words, and I kind of just stuck with that. Uh, but, but the, you know, great thing about being a writer in the modern era is that readers send me emails with their opinions about it, you know? So somebody, you know, sent me an email and said, uh, you know, I think that you used only A words in the chapter titles uh, because uh, the, your name is Amor, and the protagonist's name is Alexander. And I was like, oh yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you know, I like that. You know, and then I, I had somebody who said, um, oh, you know, I think you used only A words because A is the first letter of the alphabet and the book is about new beginnings. And I was like, that's great. <laughs> well done. All right. So yeah, that's the best I got. <laughs> At, you can add to the list anytime. Send me an email, add to the list. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Will you have a sequel to this book? Will there be a sequel? No, there will not be a sequel. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, how about a movie or a TV uh, series? Both Rules of Civility and A Gentleman in Moscow, both are being made into eight to 10 hour television movies. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Who plays the count? Thank you, yeah, so, and which is great, because the feature film, the two hours was, was too short especially for A Gentleman in Moscow. So I, was very, I didn't want it to go that way. So I'm very excited for it to be long form television. Um, the uh, Gentleman in Moscow, uh, count, uh, Sir Kenneth Branagh is gonna play the Count, which will be fun, I think it's great. Um, and, uh, and Rules of Civility, we, we, won't, we don't know the, who's gonna be uh, the cast there. But, um, but yes. Um, somebody wants to know a little bit about your writing process. And I think what they're getting at is, are you inspired at a particular time of the day? And what, just a little bit more about that. Uh, my, my writing process is, uh, yeah, in terms of really the very basic particulars, yes, I, you know, I walk my daughter to school, my son kind of goes off on his own to high school, and, uh, but uh, my wife goes, he is busy, so by 8.30 in the morning, I, I have, I'm alone, which is great. <laughs> and so you know, I have my bagel and my cappuccino and my New York Times, but at 9 a.m. I'm at my desk, and I, and I will you know, work at my desk from 9 to noon. I then take the, the work of the day uh, to usually the bar of a local restaurant where I'll have lunch by myself, and I'll either edit the uh, writing from the morning, uh, or I will take out my notebook and start sketching what I'm gonna be working on tomorrow. Now, now I said that, uh, and then in the afternoon it gets a little more vague. But, <laughs> but uh, I know sometimes I work at night, but not a lot. Um, but, but having said earlier that I'm a, I'm a big outliner, I'll give you a little bit more flavor for that. Um, you know, the, the failed novel I wrote, that I talked to, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago, this, you know, spent seven years writing this book I didn't like. And one of the things that I really learned from that book is that many of the parts I loved in that failed manuscript were the parts I wrote the first year. There's something about that, that first year of writing that's particularly bright and, and exciting and energetic. And um, so I wanted to, I want to make the most of that. So, when I design a book, I, I really, my, my ambition is to write the first draft in one year. Um, and so, so uh, Rules of Civility, when I designed that book, um, that book opens on New Year's Eve, 1938, New York, um, because I designed that book in 2005 and I began writing it on January 1st, 2006. And that book ends in New Year's Eve that year because I finished that book on New Year's Eve that year, 2006. And here's a weird one. Uh, Rules of Civility has 26 chapters because there are 52 weeks in the year. And I designed the book because I wanted to write a chapter for a week and then edit it for a week and then move on and so that eventually by the end of the year all 26 chapters would be done. Um, and then I go into the revision process. Now, A Gentleman in Moscow was very similar. Designed it for over a year. 
It took me about a year and a half to do the first draft in the case of Gentleman Moscow. Um, it is 50% it is longer than Rules of Civility for the same price, I might add. You know, so, <laughs> so, you, so you do have that going for you. Um, so, so uh, but yes, so, so as if you, you know, going back to this notion of I'm there, I'm at my desk working nine to noon kind of every day and editing at lunch or, 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 or inventing at lunch, one or the other, that's on a pretty clear chronology of, of, of a plan just sort of to keep my forward momentum going. And I started, it's hard to do, just for me, to start a new novel when I'm on the road. So my visit here today is one of the last times I will speak in public about Gentleman Moscow probably. So, because I will try to, I'll spend a year or more on the road, but then I will really try to wind that down. And I started my new novel on April 1st, you know, uh, just three weeks ago. And, you know, I kind of know chapter by chapter over the course of the next 12 months what, I'm, what I need to achieve. Um, do you have a particular favorite part in the book? Do I have a favorite part in the book? Oh my. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I love, uh, I have a couple of favorite scenes certainly, but, but I, I love the bully base sequence. I think that's great. I, I really do. I, you know, I, I, I really enjoy that. Um, particularly the juggling of the knives. I don't know, like that came out of nowhere. You know, I love that. But, um, and I, you know, and I love the, um, and, you know, going back to your thing about surprises, I guess. I'm not going to give anything big away about this, but Sophia uh, goes off to in a piano competition, and the count has uh, interest, uh, is, you know, close to this young woman who's in a piano competition, and he's waiting for her to come back because he can't leave the hotel, and he's waiting in his little room in the attic, and she's gone off with his friend, uh, who's this actress, and and she, you know they're going to come home together, and in the, the outline, my notion was that was kind of it, the count. Is going to be waiting, and the actress and you know, and Sophia would return, and they would have this kind of celebration and the thing. And as I was writing the scene, it was kind of like they were kind of going back and forth, and da 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 da, -da talking, you know. They, she's come back, and she's won the competition. They're all excited, and then like it was like instinct on the spot was like, and then there was a knock at the door because I was like, of course, Andre and Emile are going to show up, and you know, the count has a secret room, so he can't, you know, he kind of sneaks out and he has to go open the door, and there's Andre and Emil, and Andre, you know, Emil has a cake, and, and so they kind of come in, and, and they, but they have, but they, they've witnessed him, they've already in the room, excuse me, and they witness him coming out through a closet door, which is supposed to be, and they're like, what are you doing in the closet? And so he has to bring them in, and, and so then I was like, oh yeah, this is great. So now all five of them are in this little room celebrating, and then I was like, oh, it's not over yet. There's gonna be another knock at the door, you know? And so there is another knock at the door, and it's the bishop, you know? And the, you know, so, so like, I, that was, I love the scene, the, the way that kind of, in that small space, everybody starts to show up, and these critical events occur, and you kind of go from celebration to danger to, you know, something else, but I really like that scene. What are you working on right now? Uh, the book I just started is uh, about three 18-year-old boys who are on their way from Nebraska to New York City uh, in 1954. And that's all I will tell you about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, are there any particular writers that inspired you? Uh, writers who inspire me. I, you know, I, I'm 53, and so and for me, writing, and I think this is true probably of many writers of narrative, uh, writing and reading have gone hand in hand. I began reading and writing in first grade, and they've always gone step by step, side by side. So over the course of my life, I have loved and been influenced by many writers. Um, you know, and unlike girlfriends, you know, you kind of keep them with you, you know? So you fall in love with <laughs> Conrad, and Conrad stays with you your whole life, you know? And you fall in love with Faulkner, and he's with you your whole life, you know? But so, so uh, but yes, I, you know, I love uh, those, I, I love, um, Wharton, I love, uh, you know, I like Virginia Woolf a great deal. I like certainly Austin and Dickens, and, uh, but probably my three favorite books are Moby Dick, A uh, Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Gar Garcia Marquez, and War and Peace by Tolstoy. I mean, those are probably my favorites. One last question. Oh. Um, I've thought a lot about the ending since finishing the Amazing Gentleman novel. Who does the count meet after what? he escapes? <laughs> As, you know, I, I don't. We're not gonna. Have, we don't want spoilers here. But but um, what, what I said, this comes up. This came up tonight at the, uh, earlier. Um, what I can say is this, and then and then I, can I tell a story after that or tell to, to this? Well, anyway, so, so they, um, if on the last page, yes, there, a person appears, and there are some people who are unsure who that person is, but that person is described with an adjective, 
that is used seven times in the book to describe that person, an unusual adjective. So if you don't know who that person is, you are not reading closely enough. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. You know. so, sorry. You know. Tough love. Sorry, it's tough, called tough love. You know, but are we, are we running out of time? Is what you're saying? Sure, of course. Go ahead. Okay, do you want to ask another question? Go ahead. She says sorry. we're fine. Oh, wait, so, you know, one of the things, can I, I'll ask myself a question. Yeah, <laughs> by all means. <laughs> Let's get to it. So, this comes up, you know, people, people are always, you know, they ask me uh, about the role of research, which, you know, you mentioned a, a few minutes ago in, in, in my process. And, um, and, and really what I, I do not pick a topic, research it, and then write a book. You know, what, what I do is, is I write about something I'm already fascinated in. You know, so I, I was a fan of the 20s and 30s. And, and so when I set out to write Rules of Civility, I, you know, I had already read the novels, listened to the music, seen the movies, uh, studied the art movements over 30 years. And so I used that long history of, of, of fandom as the foundation for inventing my version of New York in 38. And the Russian project is very similar to that. I, I just fell in love with Russian cu uh, culture uh, as a young, as a teen or young, in my early 20s through the ni 19th century novels, of course. And then I got interested in the Russian avant-garde before the uh, war. And then I got interested in the Soviet era. And so, so I had decades of, of familiarity with Russian art in particular and, and history. And I used that as the foundation to invent the book. And, and I, I really try to avoid doing applied research when I write. And, you know, I, I think that maybe that bears some comment. And what I'd say, first of all, is that one of the interesting ironies, I think, of our times is that we, as a generation, um, have come to expect, or even really demand, more factual accuracy from our novelists than from our presidential candidates. <laughs> you know? And it, you know, it, <laughs> You know, that, that, and that is, that is crazy when you think about it. You know, that is really crazy, right? So, so but, you know, and it's one of the things, you know, people will send me emails, you know, if, if there's a wrong fact in the book, you know, oh, my God, you know, you're just, and it's some of that I really like. You know, some of it drives me crazy, but some of it I like. You know, here's a tip. If you're going to send an email to a writer, you know, with a criticism or with a correction or, you know, their grammar, you don't like their grammar or whatever, it should be, you should take the sentence. Of the, crit of the critique, the criticism, the piece of advice, whatever it is, and then you should write compliments that take up five times as many words as the criticism. <laughs> That's about the right balance, right? So, so then you get your criticism, but, but, so, but some of it I actually like, and, and like, here's an example of one I like, is, um, is this, uh, not long after the book came out, I got an email from a lovely older woman, and she says, um, she, you know, she did the five to one, she talked about you know, how much she liked the book, thank you very much. And th but then she said, you know what, she said, but I gotta tell you, you know, um, oh, and I have to set this up for those who haven't read the book, or as a reminder for those who have. Early in the book, the count is gonna be a moment of crisis. And uh, he starts spending a lot of time on the roof of the uh, uh, Metropole, where he discovers that there's a, uh, the handyman keeps bees there. And they're trying bees, uh, the honey, at one point. And the count is amazed by this notion that uh, the, the honey can taste like the, the flowers that the bees have visited. And the old man says, yeah, that's the way it works. You know, when the bees go off, you know, they, they go to the lilac, they come back, the honey tastes like lilac. You know, when the boys go off to the, 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 the roses, they come back, the honey tastes like roses. When the boys do this, whatever. So the woman sends me this email. And she says, you know, I really love the book. It meant a lot to me, and uh, I was very moved by it. She said, but I have to tell you. I do, I should tell you. I think I should tell you. That boy bees don't do that. <laughs> it's the girl bees who go to the flowers. <laughs> The boy bees don't do it. So, you know, and I love that. But I do make a note of that. And when the paperback, A General Mosca, comes out, it's going to be the girl bees who go. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, right? So, which is what it should be, right? <laughs> so, but, uh, so, right, what it, the thing that interests me in a way of, as I was saying, this, this the contemporary reading of, f for historical fact and, and the accuracy of detail and everything, I think it's a very contemporary uh, way to read. Um, that particular fine tooth comb is, is something that, that is common now. I don't think that, that readers did it for hundreds of years over the course of serious narrative. And I, and I think that the way to think about this is if you go back to Shakespeare, you know, look at Shakespeare, the, the peak of English narrative is right at the beginning. And you look at, like, say, Henry V as a play. So now Henry V 
you know, you, if you go to see, if you go see that play performed today, or you read it, or you watch the Kenneth Branagh movie, which is in the original Shakespeare, um, it is still exciting and uh, dramatic and meaningful. Uh, you know, it, it's still all of these things. Um, but now, when Shakespeare wrote Henry V, he was not trying to add to the historical record of the Hundred Years' War. You know, he, he, that's not his, his plan. Um, he's taken loosely from the Chronicles. For him, the, the, the Hundred Years' War and the Battle of Agincourt is, is sort of a backdrop. It's, it's sort of something in the distance. What he's really interested in is these other issues, like um, not the temperature on the field or how many men died in a particular battle or whether it was on the June 5th or June 6th. What he's interested in things are like, how does a young man who at the age of 20 is a gambler and a drinker and a womanizer at the age of 30 or whatever it is become a king of great honor and courage? Like, how does that happen in the life of a young man? And as the king, when the country is at war, how does he convince his fellow countrymen to leave their homes, their farms, and to come and join him to fight for their country, knowing that half of them will never come home alive? And, and what does it mean to fight for your country in the first place? What is this thing, England? What does it mean to us? Why does it matter so much that, God forbid, we should allow it to fall into the hands of the French, whoever they are? You know, these are the things that intrigue Shakespeare. Now, if you look at the Shakespearean project, uh, the settings are never very complicated in the plays. The duration is not very long. What he's really focused on are the creation of three-dimensional individuals. He's trying to create these figures. On, he's going to build his set. He's going to raise the stakes a little. But he's hoping that these individuals, who have all of the uh, whims of the rest of us, all of the impulses, all of the virtues and vices. Having raised the stakes, what he's going to do is he's going to set them inter interacting. And then hopefully, through the manner in which they exchange their sentiments and express their ideas, we will gain some glimpse of the human condition in a manner that is timeless and universal. And that's the big project. And for me, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. But so, for me, you can overplay the historical thing. You know, you can have too much detail, too many facts, too many things that you've hammered down with great care, you know, and, and that they can start to get in the way of that central mission, which is bringing these people to life in a fashion that is meaningful and through a language which is poetic and expressive. And that's really, you know, where I'm headed. That's what I'm trying. Well stated. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This is not really a question, but I think this particular comment from a member of our, our audience says it really well. Mr. Tolls, I've read, a, I've read a lot of books. I'm in my 70s. I want to tell you that your choice of words and phraseology is the best I've ever read. Thank you for an unforgettable read. So thank, thank you. you for thank being you. here. Thank you very much. Can I, can I say one other thing? So thank you very much. And by the way, I love questions like that. That's a great question. It's really good. Very thoughtful. No, but so, so I do, I do, before I go, I did want to tell one, one more story. And, and um, you know, I, I, I hope this comes across. The book is an invention. And, and, um, but inevitably, in the process of writing a narrative, uh, your personal life will express itself, surface through the imaginative process and influence the, the work. And there's no question in my mind that the greatest example of this in uh, A Gentleman in Moscow uh, is the, the character of the two young girls in the book. Um, early in the novel, the Count is befriended by a nine-year-old girl named Nina, who kind of teaches him how to think differently about the hotel. She kind of becomes his first friend under house arrest and, and has a great impact on him. Many years later, in his 50s, he meets a five-year-old girl named Sophia, who uh, has a profound impact on his life. And, and there's no question about it that my depiction of these two young women is, is affected by the fact that when I had the idea for this book, my daughter was five, and when I finished writing it, she was nine. <laughs> and my, my daughter was really the first person who taught me how shrewd a little girl can be. <laughs> they are not to be underestimated at any turn, you know? And so, so to give you a flavor for this, you know, sort of what I deal with at home and how it affects my writing, um, 
you know, New, Year, New, Year, New Year's Day last year, uh, New Year's night, w my wife, my son, my daughter, and I, we go out for dinner. And, uh, you know, and as, after seeing, I said, hey, you know, it's New Year's night. Let's go around the table and share resolutions. You know, it'll be good fun. And without skipping a beat, my daughter, who was 11 at the time, says, Dad, don't you think you should be less focused on your New Year's resolutions and more focused on your bucket list? Yes. Yes. Exactly, right? <laughs> you know. So, um, so I hit her with my cane. You know, because it's really the only appropriate response to a comment like that. Okay, but so when my daughter was five and my son was eight, their favorite restaurant in New York City is this old school Italian place called Paul and Jimmy's. It is a third generation family run. You know, it's chicken parm and, uh, you know, veal salt and boca and ossobuco, very old school. Now, my kids loved the food there. Um, but what they really loved was how they were treated by the staff. You know, when we would go, uh, they would run ahead of me and my wife, the two kids, and they would burst through the door of the restaurant. And the staff would say, oh, senor Tos, oh, la principessa, come in, come in. And, you know, by the time we got there, they would be seated at our table looking like they owned the place. Um, now, so when my son turned nine, uh, I said to him, we said to him, you know, Stokely, where do you want to go uh, for dinner for your birthday? We can kind of go anywhere within the city within reason, assuming he would say Paul and Jimmy's. But in this great wistful way, he says, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could go to Smith and Walensky's? Now, as some of you know, Smith & Walensky's is this venerable old steakhouse on the Upper East Side of New York. And I'm like, where does an eight-year-old boy find out about a steakhouse? What, you know, where did that come from? Well, it turned out that the year he turned nine was the year that they put televisions in the back of taxi cabs, and Smith & Walensky's was the very first ad. You know, so he had seen it a hundred times, you know, like that. So, so I said, hey, Stokely, you know, if you want to go to Smith & Walensky's, we can go to Smith & Walensky's. And he says, you mean it's in New York? <laughs> like, well, yes, it's in New York, you know, of course. It's in New York. So on his birthday, we all get dressed up, we head uptown, and we go to Smith & Walensky's. Now, if any of you have ever been there, what you know is that the waiters at Smith & Walensky's are these big old guys who look like butchers. And in fact, they wear white butchers' aprons. That's what they wear as, a, you know, as waiters. So we get seated in our booth. And our waiter comes over, this six foot tall guy who looks like a, in a butcher's apron. And he says, um, all right, welcome to Smith and Walensky's. Let's get down to business. What are you gonna have tonight to drink, ma'am? A martini, good choice. How about for you, sir? Another martini, well done. And for the lad, a Coca-Cola, it's on its way. And what about for the little baby? Now, yeah, the second he says this, he realizes he's made a terrible mistake from the expression on my, my daughter's face. So after a moment of silence, my five-year-old daughter says to this six-foot tall guy in a butcher's apron, she says, I am not a baby. At the other restaurant, they call me La Principesa. That was her back then. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.